So in this set of lectures, we're going to talk about some of the basic principles that we've been discussing and how they actually sort of come home to roost on actual uh, structural systems and structural elements. And we'll do this in a pretty light way. We'll get into some uh, math, a little bit of trigonometry and some, some algebra. We'll save some of the really uh, hardcore stuff for 347. At the moment, what we're most interested in is that you understand the relationship between structural forces, what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, and structural form, and particularly some of the more intuitive structural forms uh, that we deal with, that we understand, that we see out in the world sort of every day, and that through our experience we kind of understand are particularly strong. And I want to talk about why some of those are, some of the mechanics or, or nuts and bolts of some of these systems and elements, like for example, suspension bridges, which we appreciate as a kind of naturally beautiful form. And as I want to show, there are things going on in there that we may not fully comprehend, but we end up with these forms that are very, very natural and that are mathematically absolutely correct. The reason this is important is that structural form is the kind of key to good structural design. And I want to quote one of our great heroes here, Ed Allen, uh, who taught for years at, uh, at Oregon, among other places, and was known for his ability to sort of explain structures in really, really simple ways. Uh, something that we try to do as well. And one of his great mottos was that in structural design, if you get the form right, everything else is easy. In other words, if you are fluent enough in how structural form works, your intuition is going to be pretty close to what's actually accurate. And when you or an engineer comes back and actually calculates uh, that structural element or that structural system, you'll find that the math ends up being pretty easy and that you are pretty close to right. So an intuitive understanding of st structural form is a kind of key tool in the designer's toolbox. So we want to talk about uh, a handful of things. We want to first, in this video, we'll talk about uh, structural elements and also structural systems where we're using, we're basically trying to find triangles within the building. We'll talk about why the triangle is the kind of ultimate or maybe the like primeval structural form. And then very uh, briefly, I want to look at these three elements. Uh, beams, columns, and arches, because they all have sort of fairly intuitive stories to tell about why certain forms are better than others. Then in the next two videos, we'll throw some math at some of these ideas that we've looked at. We'll do a free body exercise using a simple cable structure, showing how we can uh, sort of get inside of a cable structure and look at what's going on using principles of translational equilibrium. And in the last video, we will look at uh, how we design beams, and particularly how we do a thought experiment about keeping beams not just translationally stable, but also rotationally stable, and how that gives us a clue uh, as to how to keep a beam uh, in, in simple equilibrium. So to start with, we'll look at structural forms and structural shape, and we'll do this uh, in a couple of different uh, sort of scales. Before we do, though, let's look at what we've sort of covered so far, and we'll use these principles in analyzing these structural shapes going forward. So the first and kind of foremost thing is that we're interested in equilibrium. We're interested in finding sets of vectors that balance each other out and therefore that keep uh, our buildings stable, right? They keep them from moving. Uh, we talked about two different types of equilibrium. We don't like buildings to fall down. That's translational equilibrium, moving in the X, Y, or Z axis. But we also don't like buildings to fall over. That is to rotate either clockwise or counterclockwise uh, around any of those axes. And when we're designing for statics, the science of keeping things in one place, keeping them from falling down or falling over. We have these five S's that we talked about uh, in the first week that determine how we can keep all of these uh, elements uh, in equilibrium. We, first of all, uh, design a structure to be strong enough, right? We certainly don't want structural elements to break under load. But as we talked, we also have to worry about them moving under load. And Newton says any uh, object with any mass at all, any force applied to it, uh, is going to accelerate. We try to keep those accelerations as small as we can. And we try to develop load paths that will help to resist that uh, deflection. 
Stability is what we talk about when we talk about structural systems. Uh, how, when we put all of these beams and columns together, the, the building sits on the ground in such a way that it, it, it doesn't fall over. And then we also talked about serviceability, uh, particularly how the building performs over time and whether the structure uh, is appropriate to its use. And the key to all of these really is where we put the structural material that we're using for designing in concrete, how much concrete we put uh, and where we put it for designing in timber or steel, not only what the network of those members looks like, but also how big each of those members are uh, and what shape they are. And, and it's shape that really allows us to address these other four S's, strength, stiffness, stability, serviceability. And as architects, that's kind of good news, right? We deal with uh, shape and form all the time. And if we have a library of shapes and forms that we know are appropriate to certain structural considerations, we can start there, right? And we can start to have an informed discussion with our engineer based on the intuitive shapes that we already think uh, might work. So these two libraries of uh, structural shapes or structural forms uh, occur at different scales. And at the very largest scale, scale of, say, the, the full building structure, we're usually mostly concerned with stability. And we're looking for shapes, especially as we get really, really tall or really, really long spans. Um, we're looking for shapes that are stable, right, like the camera tripod on the left, uh, whether uh, the, the structure will fall down gravity resistant, translational equilibrium, or w whether it'll fall over, lateral uh, resistant, uh, or rotationally stable. When we get into actual elements, beams, columns, girders, arches, we're often looking at where we're deploying the material within a structural element. So we're not only concerned with how big the element is, we're concerned with where the material goes. And to me, the greatest example of this uh, is, a, is a bone, right? Particularly a, a bone from a, a bird, right? A, a, a creature that uh, has to be really, really lightweight in order to get it to fly. And if you look at bird bones in particular, you see this very, very distinct pattern of most of the bone material being concentrated uh, at the perimeter of the bone, the outside of the bone, with these kind of uh, little sticks in between that are basically stiffening that. That is a, an excellent column shape, uh, as we'll see, and nature has beaten us to it by hundreds of thousands of years, right? We, we need only look at the products of evolution to realize uh, that there are this, there's this library of structural forms that's often already out there. So two scales, building systems overall, the kind of basic shape of, of the building, building frame, and then elements, looking at the individual beams, columns, arches, whatever uh, that, that go into them. When we're talking about the overall structural system, or in some cases when we're talking about the individual element, we'll, we're, our engineers are always going to have a preference for triangles, right? Triangles are the primeval structural shape. Why is that? Well, a triangle is naturally stable, right? First of all, it takes three points to define a plane. So if you have a three-legged stool, it will always sit flat on the floor. If you have a four-legged stool, three of those legs might sit flat. The fourth one might not, and the stool will rock back and forth. So three-legged stools actually better structurally than four-legged stools. Related to this, but also really critical, especially when we're dealing with really tall buildings, is that uh, a triangle uh, if, with, which has three given legs or three legs of, of given lengths, that triangle can only assume one shape, right? There's no other way to arrange three fixed legs uh, in any shape other than that single triangle. If we want the triangle to deflect, if we put a load on it that's gonna try to make the triangle deflect, we're gonna have to actually bend or break one of those triangle's legs to make the shape change, right? To cause that, to make that deflection uh, actually happen. When we apply a load to a square frame, unless we make the joints really, really stiff, what we find is that there are an infinite number of shapes that could be made out of those four legs, right? There are all kinds of parallelograms that those four legs could make. And we get this phenomenon called racking, where if those joints aren't stiff, uh, the, the members of that structural frame are going to rotate relative to one another. And you can see that we go from a rectangle to a parallelogram. Now, 
parallelogram is a fine shape, but you can see there's nothing to stop the frame from falling all the way over. Um, even if we get minor racking, things happen like doors don't open all of a sudden, or windows uh, in the building break, or cladding panels suddenly pop off of the building frame. So rectangular frames are difficult. We have to find ways to make very, very stiff joints. Triangular frames, very, very simple. All we have to do is pin the legs of the triangle together and we will get a shape that is very, very difficult to change, right? Very difficult to deflect. The actual structural elements have to bend or break for the triangle to change its shape. Now, when we have really, really large structures, we find that triangles are also good because they have a wide footprint, less uh, area at the top, so there's less of a sail as you go higher and higher, but also a broad footprint that's able to develop a resisting moment, right? That's able to resist overturning. To me, the greatest example of this is looking at the, the competition schemes for what became the Eiffel Tower uh, in Paris. And you can see that all of the engineers, all of the architects who submitted schemes, with a couple of exceptions here and there, ended up with this very, very distinct triangular profile. Some of them very close to what the, what the finished uh, design or the winning design actually was. When uh, the final scheme uh, by Eiffel won, this is about as pure a triangular shape as you can get. Notice that it's subtly curved. We'll talk about why that's a good shape when we talk about arches. Uh, and notice that it's much, much wider at the base than at the top. So there's less area at the top for the wind to, or to collect the wind. There's a broad footprint at the base that allows the foundations to develop this resisting moment, right? Resisting the overturning moment that the wind is gonna give to the, to the Eiffel Tower. And in fact, the wind loads on a tower this tall are much, much more important, much more controlling than the ground gravity loads. Gravity is fairly easy to handle. It's the wind loads that, because of this very, very long lever arm that the building has, uh, are often the most difficult to deal with. So triangles are good, and if we're just designing a tower, just a pylon out in the cityscape, um, we're going to find that, that the triangle works rather well. The problem is that architecturally, we're typically trying to create rectangular rooms in section, right? We would rather not have uh, braces, triangular braces that are coming down and, uh, and interfering with uh, our internal space. So we generally have kind of two conversations with engineers if we're building a, a tall like skyscraper or something. One of them is that we might try to find a way to triangulate the structure, to take a rectangular form and add triangles to it wherever we can to brace it. Or the other thing we might do is we might stiffen those joints. We might make connections between columns and girders very, very stiff. Engineers say that what this does is it recruits the beams and columns into resisting both gravity and lateral loads. Concrete frames are particularly uh, good for this. So this is why in super tall buildings, you often get uh, rectangular forms. The John Hancock building in Chicago has rectangular floor plates and rectangular sections. Um, but then along the outside, you can see that it's famous cross bracing is essentially taking that rectangular frame and turning it into a set of triangles, into a set of geometric shapes that are self bracing. And as we discussed, the tapering form of the tower is a way to triangulate uh, the skyscraper on a kind of big scale. Maybe not quite as dramatic a, a taper or triangulation as the Eiffel Tower, but still a useful one, right? Wider at the base, narrower at the top, so it has some inherent stability to it. A wide footprint, uh, which gives it a big, uh, over, a big resisting moment, and that comes from that very, very wide lever arm uh, at the base. Now, there are other ways to do this. Uh, if you look at older skyscrapers, you see that uh, engineers often came up with ways to, again, make these uh, connections very, very stiff. So here's a skyscraper showing what's called a portal frame. Uh, these steel arches that are put into the building that really connect the girders and the columns in a way that won't allow that rotation, right? Won't allow the frame to rack. 
if the wind blows and it tries to rack the building, it's going to have to actually bend or break those very, very deep uh, portal frames or portal arches. Um, cross bracing here, this is a way of triangulating the, uh, the rectangular bays. Uh, difficult to put a door or a window into that unless you're clever about it, like in the Hancock. And then another way that engineers uh, have to do this is with very, very stiff joints called knee braces. And here you see they are triangulating just the joints between the girders and the columns. And again, this takes that rectangular section and basically turns it into a set of triangles, right? Uh, makes the, the joints uh, work as very, very stiff elements connecting the girders and the columns and make sure that no racking can occur, or no significant racking can occur. Now, when we get uh, into sort of smaller scale stuff, we also have discussions about the shape of those individual elements. What's the best shape for a girder? What's the best shape for a column? And where we put the material is really important uh, because the way that uh, a shape resists loads or the way that a beam resists loads is often through uh, both a combination of the strength of its uh, material and where that material is in the in the in its cross section or in its long section um, if you go back and look at sort of early 19th century mills where they were using cast iron uh, you often see this very very distinctive what's called a fish belly shape uh, in the beams and this it turns out is an excellent longitudinal shape for a beam it's deeper in the middle where bending stresses are greatest and it tapers toward the end where the bending stresses are actually less why is this important well it's putting the material where it's going to do the most good right where it's going to be most effective and therefore it is saving weight because it's not putting excess material in a place where that material is not going to be working as hard now today we don't use cast iron we use steel and steel isn't molded it's rolled so it's much easier to fabricate steel in long consistent sections we have another way of thinking about where the material gets deployed in a steel beam, which is to think about its cross section and basically to resist the bending force that we're putting on it by giving the beam itself a little bit of resisting moment. So very much like the, the bottom of the Hancock is spread out so that it has sort of wide feet, we sort of turn that on its side for a beam and we try to give the beam uh, feet that are spread as wide apart as we can. When we turn it on its side, we're talking about uh, greater and greater depth, but we're talking about those feet turning into what we call flanges, the wide parts of what we call a wide flange beam. When we roll a beam, it's very easy to make this distinctive I-beam shape. And you can see that this is on its side, but uh, these two flat elements here, those are the flanges, the feet that are going to provide the, the area that will give the beam its resisting moment. And they are held apart by the centerpiece called a, a, a flange. And when we look at steel beams today, uh, lay people call these I-beams. You will learn to call them W shapes, which stands for wide flange. Um, you can see that basically what we're doing is we're trying to create little Eiffel Towers, but on their side and kind of rolled into long, consistent lengths. So the flanges are working like the feet of the Eiffel Tower, and they're putting material uh, out at the edges of the beam where they can uh, produce a resisting moment. When we put a, a load on the beam in the middle, it's creating a bending moment, and the flanges of the beam are sized and positioned so that we can build up the maximum resisting moment. We will go into this endlessly and we'll look at some of the math behind this in 347 when we talk about beam design. But just know that there's a reason that if you're looking at a steel construction site, you will see a lot of I-beams. And that is because uh, they are a very, very efficient shape to resist bending. They rely on the cross section. Fish belly beams rely on the longitudinal section. And we have a kind of library of shapes uh, that respond well to various conditions. So a fish belly beam works best for what we call a distributed load. We went over this uh, last week. We talked about a distributed load being uh, a consistent load that's applied across a beam span. And if we do diagrams showing where the internal stresses end up in that beam, what we find is that uh, we get what's called a moment diagram showing us where the bending stresses are greatest and the bending stresses are greatest right in the middle. And a fish belly beam actually sort of copies the shape 
of that moment diagram to literally put the material uh, to put the maximum depth where it's going to do the most good. If you look at some of these other loading conditions, you might see shapes that start to look familiar. Here is the moment diagram for a cantilever. We already talked about the fact that tree branches, for example, get much, much thicker toward their uh, roots or toward their base. And that is in part because the moment diagram for a cantilever puts the most bending stress not in the middle of the span, but at the, at the base of the span, uh, at the root. And then when we have point loads, where we're putting just a single discrete load, like a person or uh, a, a single box of books uh, onto a beam, we get a moment diagram that's much simpler, right? It's just a triangle. And you can imagine that being an efficient shape if we're putting a load right there in the middle. So some of these shapes, again, sort of look structurally obvious. Here's one that looks like a bridge. And if you see the loading condition for that bridge, you can see that that's exactly what we would expect to see in a, in a bridge deck, right? A distributed load, uh, the supports now sort of tucked in from the ends. And here we have this kind of cantilever shape there and there, more of a beam shape here, but it looks like an arch, right? The, the greatest depth uh, toward the middle of the span. Your intuition very often is absolutely right when you're thinking about structures. You have lived out in the world, you have seen plenty of things that stand up, and a lot of times your brain already has this kind of library of structural forms that even if we don't totally understand how they work yet, at least kind of look familiar. And these three in particular, I would say, are shapes that we see both in nature and in sort of big scale engineering all the time. So the reason that those uh, I-beams kind of work and the thing that um, we'll get into in great detail when we talk about uh, beams in 347 is that they uh, also rely on the beam's depth. It's not just where the material is, but it's how far apart those flanges get. And there are good reasons for increasing the beam's depth toward the middle of the beam. That's where the bending stress is greatest. And so that's where we really want the greatest kind of distance between the flanges, right? Those resisting uh, feet. So if, for instance, we're walking uh, across a balance beam, um, we know intuitively that a flat balance beam is going to deflect a lot more, is going to be both less stiff but also less strong than if we turn the beam on its edge, right? And here's another kind of piece of intuition that turns out to be mathematically exactly right. Um, these drawings here are showing the internal stresses, compression on the top, tension on the bottom, that's the signature of an element in bending. And you can see that with the, with the greater depth of the beam, uh, the kind of feet, the resisting moment, are f for the resisting moment are farther apart. And therefore the stress that you need in the, the ends or the, the, the flanges of the beam are going to be less stressed than if the beam is much flatter, right? Again, don't necessarily need to, uh, to fully uh, grasp this at the moment. Just know that there are reasons for some of these intuitive uh, shapes. Flat beams, bad. Deep beams, uh, good. And this also explains the kind of family of steel shapes. We looked at a wide flange or an I-beam, which has uh, these two kind of areas that are doing most of the structural work and a web in between. Um, but this also explains structural elements like channels, which are like half an I-beam. We've still got flanges. We still have a web. We use these for situations where we need to get sort of greater access to the web, but they function in the same way, right? These two flanges that provide this resisting moment, right? These feet that have steel that is working really, really hard in uh, compression, usually at the top, tension at the bottom, to resist the bending load that we're putting onto, onto the beam elsewhere. Now, we can take the same principle and we can find even more efficiency uh, by turning those beams into what we call trusses. We all kind of know intuitively what trusses look like, um, but they work in much the same way as a beam. They have uh, what we call cords instead of flanges, and you can see there are top and bottom cords, and then there are cords in the middle. And these work very similar to the flanges of a beam. The top cord in a simply loaded truss is always gonna be in compression. The bottom cord is always going to be in tension. And now instead of a solid web like we have in a, in a wide flange beam, we have a network of, what do you know, triangles, right? And what this means is that we've panelized, uh, engineers will say we've panelized that, uh, the web of that beam, we've turned it into a network of very, very light linear elements 
We've saved all the weight that would go into the web of that beam, uh, and instead we're resisting uh, the, the, the bending moment by, these, uh, by this set of cords. We're basically locking the cords together, not by a solid web, but by a network of triangles. This maybe gets more obvious when we look at uh, rectangular truss designs, and you can see that here the uh, engineers who designed these trusses are doing exactly what we talked about with the Hancock. They're taking a rectangular shape and they're uh, turning it into a series of triangles, and each one of these will have a cord on the top that will go into compression, a cord on the bottom that will go into tension, right? Signature of bending, compression on one side, tension on the other, and then a network of triangles in between that will lock them together, that will make the top and bottom cord work in concert to resist uh, a bending load that's, that's put onto the, onto the truss. Now, when we switch and go to columns, we also have a set of ideal structural shapes. Um, columns are a little bit more difficult to think about than cables, right? Cables, we can very simply say, oh, uh, you know, we're pulling on the cable, we have a, a tensile load on the cable, and we need a, a certain amount of area, cross-sectional area of material uh, to, to, uh, to handle that. Columns can fail in a couple of different ways. When we try to crush a column, um, we, it might fail in true compression, as you see on the left, right? Actually smashing the material uh, of the column itself. But when we get into tall columns, skinny columns, um, we've, we all kind of know intuitively that that column can fail not only by uh, crushing, but also by buckling. And if you think about what's going on when a column is buckling, Right? It's actually going into bending. Right? It actually looks like a beam that's deforming. And if you think about what's going on in this poor column here, um, you can see that this side of the column is getting compressed, right? squished together. This side of the column is going into tension, right? getting pulled apart. And that, again, is the signature of a beam, an element in bending, compression on one side, tension on the other. So when we're designing a very, very short column, let's call it a hockey puck, we're designing it uh, with enough material to resist just the load. When we design a tall column, we're also designing it to resist buckling. And we're going to design it not only to take the compression load, but we're also going to kind of design it as a little bit of a beam, too. We see column shapes, therefore, that reflect not only the axial load, the load along the, the, uh, the length of the column, but that also give the column some width in the middle where that buckling load, that bending load, is going to be the, the greatest. So here you see a column with tension elements on the outside, and what those are doing basically is stabilizing the column in the middle, keeping it from moving one way or another. Here's a skylon shape where there is literally greater a width in the column in the middle where the buckling force is going to be greatest. And notice the pin connections at the ends. You can't quite see it, but there's some guy wires holding the, the top there. Here's a column that is fixed at the base, right? And therefore, the, the, the greatest uh, bending load, this is basically working like a big cantilever on its side. So in addition to a good column section, this is designed also as a big cantilever sticking out of the earth. And here you can see that it is widest at the base. So these are analogous to what we call simply supported beams, just propped up at the ends. Uh, against lateral forces in this case, this is analogous to a cantilever, right? deeper at the root, fixed at the base, flexible at the, at the end. And then the last set of structural elements that uh, I want to talk about in terms of shape uh, are arches. And arches can be uh, compression arches, like you see here, that are basically uh, taking a load that's, that's pushing on them or they can be tension arches, like a suspension bridge where the load is pulling on them. And you can see that the tension uh, elements are much more slender. We're not worried about buckling. Compression elements, we have to worry about uh, the, the elements going into bending, right? And kind of uh, buckling out of the way. So compression elements tend to be uh, much, much thicker, or in the case of this uh, arch here, uh, braced against one another uh, in what you see as a truss form. And again, notice the curved shape, which is what we expect from an arch. This is uh, close to uh, what we call a funicular shape, the ideal structural shape 
uh, under loading. You can see that there's also a funicular shape in the suspension cables. Easy to get in suspension cables because they will naturally take uh, a funicular shape when you, when you hang them. Uh, we sometimes call that a catenary shape. Catena, Latin for chain, the shape that a chain takes when you, when you hang it. And when we put a bridge deck under those cables, that bridge deck is also putting a distributed load onto the cables. So even though now these cables are kind of weighed down much more with a much greater load, there's still the same family of shapes because the cable self-weight is a distributed load, the deck is a distributed load. So both of them will uh, tend to impart what we call a catenary shape. Funicular just means that it's an arch that is only taking compression uh, or tension. And you can see that in both cases, it's, it's not really a circular shape. It's something close to a parabola, right? Not quite a parabola, but if you were to draw a parabola in AutoCAD or something, you'd find a piece of it that was pretty similar uh, anyway. Now, the beauty of the arch is that if you design it right, uh, it's only in tension or compression, right? So it can be a relatively efficient shape. The problem is that what we're doing is we're taking a vertical load and we're translating it into uh, a diagonal load, right? And if you think about what's happening at the top of the towers or at the base here in the compression arch, if we push down on the arch, the feet are going to try to thrust out. And in the suspension cable, if we pull down in the middle of the cable, it's going to try to pull the towers inward. These are what we call thrusts, and they are the most difficult thing to deal with when we're talking about uh, arches, either compression arches or, or tension arches. So in the finished designs, um, when you look at big spanning uh, arches or suspension bridges, what you very often uh, are kind of fooled into not seeing are the secondary structures that take up these arches. So here, for example, the engineer has been very careful to express the kind of, uh, you know, the parabolic shape of the arch itself. These towers on either side, which look like great big monuments, are actually giant weights that are helping to keep the, the base of the arch, the bases of the arch from thrusting outward. They're putting a great big heavy weight onto the foundations that's basically taking that thrust and forcing it down into the ground. They're disguised as kind of monumental approaches, but what they're really doing uh, is just adding a huge amount of weight to the arch foundations to prevent that arch from flattening out, right? They're like big, great big bookends. Now, suspension bridges, it's even uh, sort of cleverer. Um, if you think about the cables pulling on those two towers, you can see that the towers of this bridge are kind of splayed a little bit at the base. So they've got a little bit of resistance to that moment. But what's really happening is these cables, called the backspans, are pulling in the opposite direction on the tower, and they are anchored to these gigantic buttresses tens of thousands of tons of concrete that are dug into the ground that really, uh, f but through friction, uh, keep the tower from falling into the river, right? Keep the, the thrust of the suspension arch, the inward thrust of the suspension arch, uh, balanced by an equal and opposite thrust on, the, on what we call the backspan cables. Now, where this gets really fun is when you think about shapes that would actually balance those out. Um, here is a, a bridge in Pittsburgh where the engineer has been very clever. There is a compression arch along the top, and he has also put in a tension arch on the bottom. These sort of share in the load of carrying the bridge, and if you think about it, the tension arch is pulling in on these uh, iron towers at either end. The compression arch is pushing out, and the two arches actually cancel one another out. This is what we call a lenticular truss. Um, very, very fussy to detail, very fussy to calculate, not a particularly popular structural option, mostly because of the difficulty of fabricating it. But you can see there is no heavy weight that's trying to th push the thrust into the ground or uh, restrain the towers from getting pulled into the river. The lenticular truss actually balances the outward thrust of the compression arch and the inward thrust of the, of the tension arch. Now, we can hack all these together, and this is where things get really fun. 
Um, what I've shown so far are really kind of pure examples of these structural types, but we can often uh, hack them together, hack ideas together to uh, create hybrids that are unusually efficient or that uh, do a particular task really well. So here we have a couple of examples of what look like arch bridges, um, but they're really too shallow to be pure tension or compression arches. And what they are instead are beam arches. They, are, they uh, uh, are essentially very, very shallow arches, or if you want to think about it, they're very, very slightly curved beams, and they will go into bending. This one is basically working like two cantilevers. Notice that it's deeper on the ends than in the middle. Uh, here, the Eads Bridge in St. Louis, it's a little bit steeper and therefore works a little bit more like an arch. And then you can see that in both cases, the engineers have hacked it even further by turning the ideal structural shape from a solid form into a truss, triangulating all of the little panels of the arch there, and with literally uh, hundreds of elements, turning the cantilever, the deep cantilever here, uh, into a network of triangulated panels that makes it work like a truss. So uh, using some arch principles, mostly in compression, uh, allowing it to go into a little bit of bending and treating that, in this case, like two cantilevered beams, and then saving weight by taking out that web of the beam and instead uh, triangulating the, the, the space in between to make the top and bottom of the beam arch work in concert, work together, take tension and compression uh, together uh, without all of the dead weight of, of a solid web. Um, hacking like this is not only permissible, it often leads to greater efficiency. And so it's often something that structural engineers will, will, will try to do. Okay, one final example, and that is uh, a, what we call a cable stayed bridge. These are funicular designs that rely simply on tension cables to hold up uh, long spanning decks. And the longest bridge in the world, the Seven Mile Neo Viaduct uh, in France, uh, uses this, uses this series of masts marching through the valley, uh, compression elements that then hold up these fans of cables. And at first glance, this seems like a really, really simple uh, way to do it, right? The cables all have very simple shapes. They're all straight. Uh, and what they basically do is they break the deck down into very, very short spans, which allows the deck to be very lightweight. The deck's only spanning from cable to cable. Uh, and it basically supports the deck at all of these points, making all of those spans like little tiny uh, short spanning beams. Now, in fact, uh, cable state bridges are not so simple and they're good lessons about equilibrium and forces and loads uh, in the, the design of a cable state bridge. If you think about how the deck load is being taken up, right? Um, the, the deck is gonna weigh a certain amount for every little piece of span. And that load is going to get picked up if we just focus on this end cable. There's going to have to be a vertical reaction uh, that, that resists the downward pull, the gravity load uh, of that piece of deck. Okay, that's fine. All well and good. We can develop a vertical reaction in this slanted cable because it's heading upwards. So there can be a vertical uh, reaction in that cable. But notice the geometry. Because it's at an angle, to get that much vertical resistance, we also need to, the, the arrow needs to be within the cable, and that is also going to have a horizontal component. So the way the force triangle for that little piece of the bridge looks, we have the vertical resistance, right? An arrow that is equal and opposite to the gravity load. Um, that is gonna determine the length of the arrow that we draw along the cable. But because the cable is at an angle, the arrow has to be at an angle. And what that means is that we also have, in addition to that vertical component, we also have a significant horizontal component. What does this mean? It means that that cable is not only holding the bridge up, it's also pulling back. It's pulling in on the deck. Now, the cable itself has to stay in equilibrium, so we need an equal and opposite force triangle up at the top. Notice that the arrow here is pulling in, so at the top we also have an arrow that's pulling in, and that's the signature of tension, right? The, you can think of the cable as pulling in on its two uh, ends, right? Pulling with tension there, pulling with tension there. 
those two arrows cancel each other out so that the cable is in equilibrium. But if we think about what's going on inside the cable, the cable is experiencing this force in tension along its entire length. So now look at what's happening. We have a vertical component here. We have an equal and opposite vertical component here. What that means is that the cable is pulling down on the tower. So the tower is going to be in compression, right? It's going to have to build up an internal stress that is equal and opposite to the downward pull of the cable. And notice that that arrow is going to be the same pretty much as this arrow for this uh, cable. The tower is going to have to have an equal and opposite reaction at the base. And that actually is also going to have to take into account all of the other downward pulls that each one of these cables are putting on to the, to the tower. So already we have a deck here. We have the tension element, the cable here. That's pretty obvious. But we're going to have a huge compressive force in that tower by the time we're done. Now the other thing is that those horizontal arrows have to get resisted as well. And they are going to get resisted by the deck. If you think about what that cable is doing to the deck there, it's lifting it up, but it's also pulling in on it, putting the deck into compression. And so in addition to these very, very elegant, lightweight cables, um, we have two what are probably very bulky compression elements. And usually these towers are in heavy steel or concrete. And if you think about it, that deck also has to be designed as not only a set of short spanning beams, but is a very, very long and toward its uh, end, a very, very heavily loaded column, right? The deck is kind of the secret sauce to a cable stayed bridge structure because this is actually resisting the inward pull that necessarily comes with the upward pull of that cable. Now, how do we keep the whole thing stable, right? If we zoom out and stop thinking about elements for a minute and start thinking about systems, we can see that we have a lot of weight out here. We have a, a tower here that either is going to have to be really, really firmly anchored to the ground, or it's going to not be in rotational equilibrium. All of this load out here is going to cause the tower to rotate counterclockwise in this case. Now, we could put an equal and opposite set of uh, cables and a deck on the other side. And this is usually the way it's done. We put the tower somewhere in the middle of the span and we have uh, decks on either side that we hope will kind of balance out. Or we could have one massive cable that is tied back like in the George Washington Bridge to an anchorage somewhere in the ground. And that cable is going to have to provide the, um, the, 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 the resistance or the, the backward pull that will be equal and opposite, not just to this cable, but to all of the cables uh, that, are, that are working on the tower. We'll have an equal and opposite force triangle down here as well. And notice that the cable here is going to be pulling up on its anchorage and in. So this anchorage either has to be really, really heavy or it's got to get screwed down into the bedrock uh, to keep it from getting pulled out uh, of, of the ground. Um, cable state bridges can get really uh, kind of crazy. So here's one by Santiago Calatrava where instead of that backspan, uh, Calatrava has just designed a really, really heavy tower. And the tower by leaning back is providing the stability, right? It's the equal and opposite uh, overturning moment to the weight of the deck uh, that's the deck is trying to topple this thing over counterclockwise. The tower is trying to topple it over uh, clockwise. And Calatrava has calculated the weight of the deck, calculated the weight and the angle of the tower so that the thing more or less balances perfectly. You can see there's a giant concrete joint down here, though, that manages to take up uh, any differential. So really heavy truck uh, or a wind load that blows against the tower, uh, the difference can get taken up by that stiff joint in the base. All right, good fun. Uh, in the next video, we'll get into a very simple cable structure. And just like we did with the cable state bridge, we'll try to figure out uh, how the arrows have to work to keep it in equilibrium. And this time we'll actually throw some numbers at it and show how using simple trigonometry, we can actually calculate how much load goes into each of several cables uh, in, a, in a cable state system.